Congratulations! A VC has verbally committed to investing in your company. That's awesome, but don't pop the champagne just yet because you may not realize there is a long way to go before the money hits your bank account. Today, we're going to talk to an actual VC about the typical next steps after you get a verbal commit. So there are actually a lot of steps, Janelle, that take place after a verbal commitment to invest happens from a VC to a founder. But this all depends actually on what stage you're in. If you're at the pre-seed, seed stages, normally the process is relatively quick. If you're doing things via a Y Combinator safe or convertible note, these are very simple legal documents that venture capitalists and founders use to get money signed and wired. But it sometimes it's not that chill. Uncapped Notes is a series produced by Hustle Fund designed for first time founders. Follow us on socials and don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. If you're doing a priced equity raise or even doing some of these safes and convertible notes, but there's some weird kind of side letters, which we'll talk about in a second, this can get kind of complicated. So oftentimes when you're taking money from a venture capitalist, there is a checklist of things that they need to verify with you before they are allowed legally to wire money to you based on their limited partner agreement. This is the contract that they signed with their LPs. So some of these things include, and I'm not going to read them all off, just making sure that you are incorporated, ideally a Delaware C Corp, and there's a certificate of incorporation. They're going to want to see bylaws, board consents, founder stock purchase agreements, option plans, 409A valuation, cap tables, article of solo incorporator. I'm going to stop talking right now. It's a lot of things. And some of these terms you're just going to have to Google or probably actually work with an attorney on to make sure that you have these items buttoned up. So not that simple. In addition to that too, there are some other things that are really important, including for things like hustle fund. Sometimes we want to run a background check to make sure this person that we just met, do they have any criminal background history or anything like that? Any active lawsuits that could put the business at threat. These are very simple to run, relatively inexpensive and very common in venture capital. A new one that we actually think about a lot is actually an OFAC background check. So I don't remember what OFAC stands for, but this is a new treasury department rule that basically means we have to run your name and contact information through the treasury department database to make sure that you're not aligned with terrorism or coming from state sponsored banned lists, sanctions lists, and so forth. So just be aware of that. And especially if you have a really common name, <laughs> like a John Smith or something that actually might trigger some false positives as well. So what founders often get confused by are VCs that are asking them to sign side letters. Hold up one second, Eric, what's in a side letter? Yeah, great. Thank you, Janelle. So a side letter, first of all, is this document that is outside of maybe the safe or convertible note or even the price equity agreement that you're about to sign that actually outlines some additional rights that the venture capitalist is asking. So a common term that you're going to see in a side letter are things like prorata rights, which is essentially the VC asking for their ability to allocate more capital into your company with subsequent fundraises. That's a really, really common one. A second really common feature of a side letter are things like most favored nation rights, MFNs. So this essentially means that if a VC comes in after and tries to negotiate successfully a lower valuation than the previous investor, the previous investor it has the ability to also reset their valuation to the lower amount. I actually think that's pretty fair. As a founder, that was something that I was pretty comfortable with because I wanted to make sure that we were being loyal to our earlier investors as well. So there's some other things that can happen inside letters, and this is something that you definitely want to review with an attorney. And assuming that you can get through all this stuff, the investor checklist, you get through the side letters, everything looks good, your attorney potentially has signed off or you have read it and have signed off, then there is the next step of calling your VC. So this is actually a very interesting step that I thought was so ass backwards <laughs> when I became a venture capitalist, which is most VCs need to verbally verify your wire details. Now, this is super important because there is a lot of fraud and scams that take place when it comes to wire transfer. So being able to jump on the phone or Zoom chat and just say like, hey, Janelle, is this your routing number? Is this your account number? very important to do. And it's actually a good safety mechanism for you as well, because you do not want that money lost. 
And then finally, the last step is the money hits your bank accounts. But this is also where it can get a little bit fraught. So I don't love this. There are VCs who may commit to investing in your company, but they have no money. Come on, how does that happen? The most common reason why this happens is that the venture capitalist is still raising capital themselves. So let's take the example of venture capital firm X, right? They say like, okay, Janelle, we love you. We would love to be your first check in for $100,000. And then you go through the entire process and then you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting for the wire to happen. And then Janelle responds back saying like, what's going on with this cash, baby? And then the VC will respond saying like, well, as you know, and they may not have told you this, we are actually still in the process of raising our first fund. And we haven't hit our first close yet where we can call down some money from our investors so that we can deploy it to you. So just be patient. There have been cases I've heard where founders have waited for a year and then eventually were just ghosted because the VCs couldn't raise the money successfully. So this is a big trap. And one that is a risk that I didn't realize until I came into this industry as a venture capitalist. By the way, at Hustle Fund, we always wire as quickly as possible because we think that this is a remarkably disrespectful thing to do. So is there anything that you would recommend founders look for so that they can catch signs of these annoying practices? Yeah, that's a really great question. So the first and foremost is maybe a reference call talking to some of the existing portfolio founders or those who may have engaged that you've heard on the side. And you know, we've actually put together an episode on reference calls a little bit earlier, a couple of weeks ago that founders can refer to, to run those calls really efficiently. So that's important. But there are a set of questions that I think founders should ask VCs, which is, when did you raise capital? Are you still in the process of fundraising? If so, when is your anticipated first close or second close? How long should we expect from your commitment to receiving a wire? Because we have heard that there are oftentimes delays in this process and we want to move forward quickly. And then finally, um, this is actually a very technical term, but how much money has been called by your current fund? This one's also pretty important. So this might be worth at some point, Janelle, an episode on capital calls itself so that founders understand how this works. But you, when a venture capital firm raises, let's say, $10 million, the money is not immediately wired all up front to the VC. Instead, the VC is going to slowly call down this capital as new investments happen. So if Janelle, let's say, were my sole investor, my LP, and she committed $10 million, I might take small sips at a time saying like, well, I got this new deal. It's going to be a $250,000 investment. I'm going to call $250,000. So it was at like 2.5% of your entire $10 million capital commitment so we can fund this deal. That's how this industry works. But if you're at like 90%, 95%, 98% capital called, that actually might create a conflict where you may have overcommitted and said like, well, we invest in both Eric and Janelle. It turns out that we actually have only enough money to fund one company over the other. So who's it going to be? Probably Janelle, right? Never <laughs> Eric. But... <laughs> It's one of those things where as a founder, you must be thinking, how could you let this happen? It actually is very easy to happen. This kind of fund financing accounting world can get a little bit messy at times, but it's still not cool. So those are some questions I hope and encourage founders to ask from their VCs. And I will make a side note, which is you almost never find these kinds of delays in the same way with angel investors. Generally, they kind of know what's in their balance sheet, their bank accounts, and they can just sign and wire pretty quick. So a plug for the angels out there. You're the best. So founders, we've shared what you can most likely expect after a VC has committed to investing in your company. But maybe you have some stories and experiences that you can share with us and the other founders in this community. Drop those in the comments below. And please remember to like and subscribe to Uncapped Notes.